Hi everybody, we know the macro objective for inflation is low and stable inflation. And that implies that if inflation gets very high out of control, there are more costs than there are benefits. So in this video, let's look at what the costs of high inflation are, but also what the benefits of low and stable inflation are. Let's go straight to the costs of high inflation. One of the biggest costs is a loss of purchasing power for households, for workers in the economy. Assuming that wages, incomes are not rising in line with inflation, then in real terms, workers are worse off, households are worse off, and that can affect their ability to buy basic life-sustaining goods and services. It can affect their living standards. For those on the lowest incomes in society, it could actually drive them into poverty, uh, into deprivation. So this is a real concern, a basic issue to understand, but a significant problem when inflation gets out of control. It erodes the purchasing power of money. At the same time, high inflation also erodes savings. The assumption here is that interest rates are not necessarily rising in line with inflation, in which case the interest rate you might be receiving on your savings is much less than the inflation rate. So in real terms, your savings are losing value. This is very bad news for those who rely on their savings. Think the unemployed, think the economically inactive, think old age pensioners who are relying on their savings to live off. It can mean a fall in living standards for them, but also those who are saving money in order to buy a house, let's say. It's gonna be harder for them to reach their goals, their financial goals. But also we can talk about shoe leather costs. When there is high inflation, which erodes the real value of savings, a lot of people will spend time trying to look for other bank accounts which give higher rates of interest, but there is time involved in that research. There's a lot of effort involved in that research and there's an opportunity cost there. These people could have been working and earning income instead and that is what shoe leather costs are all about. The reason it's called shoe leather costs is back in the day when banking wasn't digital, people would have to physically go with their money to different banks searching for a better rate of interest and the cost to them would be the erosion of their shoe leather as they were walking around different banks. So that's where the name comes from. But also, as savings are eroded, it puts people off saving, which isn't good for the long-term health of the economy. High inflation also erodes export competitiveness. If inflation is high in one country relative to others, then that country's exports are gonna be less internationally competitive, reducing demand for exports, reducing revenue from exports, uh, worsening the current account position, maybe harming economic growth. This is especially bad news for countries who are trade dominant, trade reliant, export reliant for economic growth. Maybe the biggest issue with inflation is this one, the risk of high inflation becoming anticipated and then it's spiraling, creating potentially hyperinflation. This can happen in two ways and one kind of less significant way. Um, so first of all, through a wage price spiral. As inflation is high, and workers anticipate it, what are they gonna do? They're gonna bargain for higher wages, of course they are. They wanna keep up with the cost of living. So they go to their employees, they ask for at least an inflation equaling pay rise. And if workers give it to them, that's gonna, sorry, firms give it to them, that's gonna increase the cost of production for firms. What are they gonna do? They're gonna pass on those higher costs via higher prices. Increasing inflation, what are workers then gonna do? They're gonna ask for an even higher pay rise and boom, you get an inflation spiral from that. But also you can get it from the consumer side. So when there is high inflation that consumers are anticipating, the rational thing to do is to bring forward your consumption. Even if you don't need those goods, let's say right now, you actually need them in six months or a year, why would you wait six months or a year? That's a stupid thing to do. Rational consumers will buy now to protect themselves from what they think is going to be high future inflation as well. So buy now when prices are lower than what you think they're gonna be. The problem is if all consumers act rationally like that, and everybody brings forward their consumption now, that's gonna drive up C, drive up AD, increase demand pull inflation. You get a spiral that way as well. You've also got the concern of menu costs. If inflation is high, rising, firms have to continually print new menus, new price catalogs. They have to keep updating their price tags. That's costly for them. They then pass that on via higher prices. Menu costs, that's known as. So this is a way in which prices keep rising and you could end up with hyperinflation that ruins an economy completely. Uh, probably the most dangerous consequence of high inflation here, it also will mean all the other costs of inflation intensify, it gets even worse. Fiscal drag is a very stealthy cost of inflation. Oh yes, very stealthy indeed. So this is when inflation is rising and workers are receiving higher income, but only in line with inflation, let's say. 
In real terms, those workers are not better off. Their pay is simply rising in line with inflation, in line with the cost of living. But if that pay rise means they get dragged into higher tax bands in a progressive income tax system, then actually they're worse off. They're going to be paying higher rates of tax. Their living standards is then going to decrease. That's the concept of fiscal drag. Now, this is very good news for the government because they receive a tax revenue windfall, so they like it, but it's very bad news for consumers, a subtle kind of unrealized cost of inflation for most people. Now, the assumption here is that the tax bans in a progressive income tax system themselves don't rise in line with inflation. Then the concept of fiscal drag is a real concern. If they do rise in line with inflation, this one isn't a cost, as we said in theory. And then we have the concern of inflationary noise. This is when the inflation rate is volatile. It might be rising plateaus and rises again, or it might go up and down, up and down. The problem with volatile inflation is that the price signaling function of market forces completely loses its value, loses its significance. Now, we know that when prices go up, it's because there was a shortage in the market. We understand higher prices for that reason. And if prices are low, it's because there is a surplus in the market. So high prices, low prices mean something for consumers and for producers. But when inflation is volatile, prices rise and then they plateau, they rise again, people start to lose the understanding of what's happening with price and why. There is uncertainty out there in the economy. People are confused. And when that happens, consumers put off their consumption. Firms put off their long-term investment plans. Uncertainty is not good for C and for I and can hold back economic growth because of that uncertainty. That's inflationary noise. But are there any benefits of inflation, especially if it's low and stable? Well, absolutely. One of the simplest benefits is that workers can bargain for higher wages, even if all they get is an inflation equaling pay rise, even if all they get is actually just a nominal pay rise, not matching inflation. The point is workers like higher wages, higher income. It's nice that, you know, at the end of a month, you get more pay in your pay packet. Workers like that. So this is good for morale. Uh, it could be good for productivity. Simple benefit, but one that we should consider. Also, with low and stable inflation, consumption will happen naturally. You won't get consumers bringing forward their spending. You won't get consumers delaying their spending, anticipating deflation. Simply, high inflation is not anticipated. Deflation is not anticipated. Consumers buy goods and services when they need to. In that sense, consumption is fluid, and that's good news for economic growth. You're not going to get shocks either way. Firms are encouraged to increase output if inflation is low and stable because they know they can raise their prices and earn more revenues. So there is a chance to make more output, sell more at a higher price, you can earn more. Um, at the same time, this is a novel little benefit here. A little bit of inflation can mean unemployment stays low in a recession. Yes. Now we know in a recession, it's normal for firms to look to sack workers. Um, why? Because their revenues are falling, so it's a good way to keep costs under control and keep their profit margins at a decent level. The problem is, though, firms don't really want to do that. It's hard to have skilled, productive workers. The last thing you want to do is to get rid of them. They're hard to get back again. So firms would rather not do that. If there is some inflation, there is a nifty way that firms can actually keep their workers in place. So let's say inflation is 5%. What firms can do in that year is raise their prices by 5% and hopefully get an increase in revenue from that. But if they give their workers, let's say, a 1% pay rise, well, their costs are increasing by 1%, and hopefully their revenues, because they've increased prices by 5%, will be rising much more. So they can still remain relatively profitable, still by keeping workers in place and giving them a slight pay rise. Now, this is good news, very good news for firms, because they keep their productive workforce, workers that are hard to get otherwise, um, and they're keeping a lid on their costs, right? But also it's good news for workers. They stay in work in a recession when they might see unemployment rising in other parts of the economy and other industries. And it's very good news for the government, right? Because a key macro objective doesn't necessarily get out of control. So this will be a really cool point to say, go back to 2010 in the UK, uh, when we were in the depth of the financial crisis, we had inflation of around five, five and a half percent at that time. But unemployment did not skyrocket. It did not get wildly out of control. You could argue this is what firms were doing back then. Inflation also reduces the real value of debt. As we've seen, you know, workers can bargain for higher wages, so wages could be increasing. Firms might be able to make more profit. 
when there is higher inflation. So wages, profits, revenues tend to rise. And as a result of that, it becomes easier to service debt. Now we know debt of any form is always a fixed concept, whether it's a mortgage debt, whether it's credit card debt, whether it's corporate debt, business debt, it's always a fixed value. So if wages, if profits, revenues are rising alongside, it's easier to service that debt with a bit of inflation. But also inflation directly can improve the state of government finances. Governments get a fiscal windfall when there is inflation. We've already said how fiscal drag can occur. So workers who are earning more might be dragged into higher tax bands and thus the government benefits that way. But also any taxes that are based on nominal values of goods and services, take VAT for example. Well, as prices rise, the government's gonna collect more revenue from that, even something like fuel duty for example. The government will collect more as prices rise, the price of fuel rises. But also governments might not be spending as much on public services, maybe in real terms, there'll be a fall in funding for public services. In real terms, there might be a fall in public sector wages. So on, even on the government spending side, governments can benefit there. So yeah, governments definitely like um, inflation. They get a benefit, but also it reduces the real value of their debt. Let's evaluate now. And in evaluation, we're gonna make a judgment. When are the costs of inflation greater than the benefits? Well, definitely the rate is key. Low and stable inflation, we tend to get more benefits than costs, but higher rates of inflation, these costs are significant, very significant, and you risk spirals much more. The cause is crucial as well. Generally speaking, demand pull inflation is more favorable than cost push inflation for two reasons. At least with demand pull inflation, we get higher growth, we get lower unemployment at the same time. Whereas cost push inflation, we tend to get lower growth, higher unemployment, stagflationary concerns, stagnant growth alongside higher rates of inflation, horrible. But also demand pull inflation is easier to solve than cost push. We can use contractionary demand side policies. Whereas cost push inflation, if it gets out of control, a lot of the time there's nothing you can do as a central bank or a government to deal with that. So for that reason, generally speaking, demand pull is better. Not all the time, but generally speaking. The duration is key. Long-term high rates of inflation can become anticipated and spirals, hyperinflation concerns become more prevalent in that situation. In the same regard, anticipated inflation is terrible. That often comes if inflation is high and long-term in nature, then you're risking your spirals as opposed to if it's unanticipated and also the stability of the rate. Uh, the more volatile it is, the more you're risking inflationary noise, harming consumption and investment in the economy. So that guys covers all the major costs of high inflation and the benefits of inflation is relatively low and stable. It can be really deadly high inflation, a real concern for an economy, that's for sure. Now you know why. Thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned for the next video. I'm gonna do the same thing for deflation. See you then.